Satellite distribution of the following program is made possible by a grant from the Detroit chapter of Safari Club International. Hi there, I'm Fred Trost. Now this is not my opening day buck. It's a 16-pointer. Belongs to Steve Nobach. Steve, it's Thursday night. You know what that means. It's time for Michigan Outdoors. You got it. State of Michigan. This is what you've been looking for, an opening day buck. But Steve, uh, you live down in Eaton Rapids. You farm down there? Yes, I do. So you're out on your tractor every day, and you probably had this buck uh, psyched out long ago. I had never seen this particular buck. I'll be darned. But this was opening morning. What time? About 11.30 in the morning. And you were hunting, what, a woodlot or corn? No, field? I was uh, actually out in a great big flat field of wheat stubble, but there was a small drain going down through the field to drain it mm -hmm. and there were some willows along some parts of it so my brother brother-in-law and I decided to go down there and see if there was any deer in there and there were what, what was he doing at the time was he feeding or he was laying flat on the ground absolutely flat trying to hide from me so he heard you coming I'm sure he heard me coming and so he got up, and uh, you got him a 16-pointer. What a fantastic rack. It's very symmetrical. And you say you never saw this buck before all your times out on the tractor? I don't know where this buck has been. I do not. Well, there must be more like it down there. There's an 8 and a 10-point that I thought was there, but this guy got up. Great. That's a great buck. Well, you've got this entered in the DNR's Big Buck Contest. Yes. Right? Okay, mm -hmm. well, you'll probably be back December 3rd, just uh, two weeks from tonight on this show with this buck. Also get you down to Outdoor Rama on Big Buck Night. And I think we're going to have a sportsman's dinner coming up in January with uh, Channel 23 and Michigan United Conservation Clubs and Michigan Outdoors. We'll get you in on that. In fact, any of you, you don't have to have a deer this big by any stretch of the imagination to get in on the Big Buck Contest, but we're going to have about 10 Big Bucks down on the show. Well, you farm down there in Eaton Rapids. Uh, Steve, have you done this all your life? Yes, I have. Farming? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I worked at Oldsmobile four and a half years, but I was farming while I was working at Oldsmobile. You too. milked the dairy cows? I've milked dairy cows for six years. So, uh, well, now you're, you're a buck hunter. Very, very famous in the Eaton Rapids area, and congratulations. Well, that's good news for Steve Nobot. Good news for us to know that there are bucks like that. And uh, Ed Groves, uh, what kind of good news does the DNR have about opening day? Well, Fred, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. First, the good news. This deer season looks like it's going to be the record breaker that the DNR predicted. In the northern two-thirds of the state, hunting pressure appears to be about the same as last year, but in southern Michigan, it looks like a record number of hunters will take a record number of deer. All reports show that more bucks are being seen. They're larger, healthier, and have bigger racks than in past years. Opening day conditions were great, almost too good for hunters. They tended to stay in their blinds all day and didn't get out and move those deer around like they usually do up north. And I imagine a good share of the hunters caught a nap in the sunshine sometime Sunday afternoon, so it was a pleasant opener in that respect. But not in every respect. This season has already been spoiled by as many deaths due to firearm accidents as we've had for the entire 15-day season last year. Our condolences go out to the families of those involved. Most hunting accidents occur within a hunting party, which means within a family. It's a very, very sad situation. But we feel a need not to pass off or ignore these tragedies. They can be prevented, just like auto accidents can be prevented, by being more safety conscious. One fatality occurred while a 14-year-old was climbing under a fence with a loaded gun. Another 17-year-old fell out of a tree and shot himself. And that's one reason why hunting in trees with firearms is illegal. Several fatalities occurred when the shooters became so intent on shooting that deer that they didn't even realize that their own hunting partners were in the line of fire. All of them tragedies we wish didn't happen. Join us here at Michigan Outdoors by extending your sympathy to the families and becoming more safety conscious with guns. Fred? Well, Ed, that's sad news indeed. Those deer season fatalities sort of put a damper on the uh, great deer season that we're having so far. Hopefully next year will be the year we can make it through without any deer season fatalities. Keep your fingers crossed on that. We'll hunt for solutions to that problem. And right now, let's talk with Rans Hill from the DNR. Rans, you're in charge of the anti-poaching program, a report all poaching, hunting for the solution to the problem of poaching. Now, is, is it really that big of a problem in Michigan? Very severe, yes. 
very severe. Do you, I've heard estimates that maybe as many deer, for example, are taken illegally as legally. Do you I would think say so? at least or more. Wow. That's a, we're talking a million, maybe a million and a half deer are poached. Well, this is a guesstimate, but uh, indications we have, there's, there's more deer killed illegally than the normal person would imagine. How? When? The poachers work at night, right? Shining? This is right. Uh, deer poachers are active throughout the year. Uh, there's large active poaching rings that sell deer commercially, and a great amount of their deer hunting does transpire in that time. They must use local people, though, to shoot the deer. Uh, generally, they'll have an organization set up where they'll have shooters and a pickup man and then an outlet where they sell. A sticky, sticky problem for a conservation officer to infiltrate on those rings. It's very difficult to work. What about the, the other game, rabbits, pheasants, grouse? Is, that, uh, is there much poaching going on there? Yes, uh, there's a considerable amount of poaching there also. There's also commercial ventures in those. Uh, most of our pheasant problems uh, are not of that nature. They transpire just before the season and then during the early winter months when the pheasants group up when they get the first storms. And then your birds of prey, is that considered poaching too, uh, shooting a, a hawk or an owl or an eagle? That's a violation of both federal and state law. Severe penalties for that. Yes, there is. And fish, tell me about fish. Who, uh, who violates there? Sport fishermen? Difficult to point your finger. Uh, there are some sport fishing violations, but they're not of the consequence of the commercial violator who violate to sell for monetary gain. Boy, well, where, where do people buy the game that is poached? Uh, I'm not asking you for a tip. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, where, uh, how, where does it go? There are many outlets. Uh, a lot of the fish that are, are shipped out of state, uh, there are a lot of fish sold within the state. Uh, generally, the sellers are very careful that they only sell to known persons that they can trust. It's difficult to get into an organization that you can buy from. Does any of this make its way to restaurants? Uh, is there any chance that you eat in a, you know, a little uh, quickie joint that is a maybe, uh, you know, a sleazy looking operation, have a hamburger and might get some venison? It's very possible. And the fact is, it's a fact. Venison oh. and walleyes and things of that nature. Well, if someone wants to call this hotline, call the 800 number toll free, what type of information, uh, what level should they put it on? In other words, they hear people shooting at night or they suspect they have some, some illegal meat that they know about that's being sold? Is, is that part of poaching too? That's yes, it is. Uh, the information we generally want from the individual in the field is information on all ongoing violations and violations of selling like you mentioned. Uh, Okay, well this is funded, of course, 25 cents of everyone's hunting and fishing license goes for the RAP program, and will for the next two years? We've got about two years left. And you've had, what, nine, ten thousand 10,000 calls? Uh, we've had in excess of 9,000 calls from the public. And when they finally turn into arrests, what have the judges done? Have they been letting them off? Our conviction ratio has been excellent, uh, ranging between 95 and 97 percent. Terrific. Well. Folks, keep on calling if you're aware of any violations, any poaching violations. We'll crack down on this problem in Michigan through the DNR. Thank you, Rance. It's worth my 25 cents. I hope it's worth yours. Now let's go to a wildlife sketch right now of some bucks, some big bucks that lose their antlers in September. And right there is a set of antlers that were lost by a buck in September. John Nellist from the Houghton Lake Research Station up there, a little north of us, a wildlife technician. Right. Well, you're in charge of uh, the Porter Ranch, the place where the deer lose their antlers in September. What is the Porter Ranch, uh, anyway? I don't think a lot of people are aware of what's going on up at Houghton Lake. Well, Fred, uh, Porter Ranch, also known as the Houghton Lake Wildlife Research Area, it's uh, one of two deer research air, uh, stations in Michigan. The other one is located in the UP. Uh, we're primarily involved in, in nutritional studies at the research pens there. Well, how many deer do you have? We've got approximately 120 deer in the pens now. What do you feed them? We feed a pelletized food that uh, we find that is about the best that we can feed them from commercial food. And of course, is this anything like the deer eat naturally? No. What, what is the best thing for deer? Well, in the summertime, there's no problem as far as deer food. They have plenty of grasses and things. Uh, winter is a critical time and this is where we've been involved in looking for some of the better winter foods. 
course, cedar is probably the best. However, it's not available to the deer anymore. Mm -hmm. Because of the brow over browsing right. that's gone on? Yeah, in most of your cedar swamps, the browse line is above what the deer can reach. Um, yeah, so this research you're doing up there is very important. Right. It affects the future of the nutrition of the deer herd, what we're going to do to solve the problems. Well, you're chasing these deer around here, trying to get them in different pens, and of course you keep them in pens up there, which leads into the story about uh, why they lose their antlers in September. How do deer act in pens? Do they become tame like cattle? No, they, uh, they usually never lose their fear, their fear of man, and uh, these bucks here are particularly dangerous at this time of the year when they're in the rut, and, and we have to be careful. That's one of the reasons that we saw the antlers off, and another reason is to protect the does from the bucks. A doe in the wild can get away from a buck, and, and but one in the pens here, he can get her cornered and tear her apart with those antlers in no time. Of course, he tears her apart if he doesn't... Uh fulfill his base right. desires. Right, and if she isn't ready, then... A lot of people don't understand that, that a doe is only in heat uh, in the month of November, maybe only one day, one or two days. Right. The rest of that time, the bucks are chasing him. That's true. Well, right here, in order to uh, get this buck down where you can saw the antlers off, Dr. Fay, who's retired now from the DNR, used to work at Rose Lake, has shot it with a tranquilizer gun. It'll take 15 or 20 minutes to put it out. But you know, a lot of people think that the bucks are so smart because they're always behind the does. They think they send the does out. Yeah, this is sort of folklore almost that is maybe from the days of Bambi. Right, yeah, what they're doing is chasing the does. They spend, uh, right now, during this month, they're spending a considerable amount of time chasing does. What, what does a buck eat in November? I mean, does he eat the normal browse? Does it, well, at this time of the year, if you've got a good acorn crop, then uh, they're going to be feeding quite heavily on the acorns. However, if, uh, like this year, we don't have a very good acorn crop and they're eating what grasses they can still get, and they won't go to browse until after we get the first deep snowfall. Well, I had heard that bucks don't eat as much during the rut. No, they're uh, more concerned with chasing does at this time. They uh, lose considerable weight and, uh, and go into the winter in rather bad shape. Year after year, this True. is typical. Well, what uh, here is you're sawing the antlers off. Does this affect the temperament of a deer at all to have its antlers removed? Right. They, uh, they take a lot of pride in these antlers, and it's something that they're careful with through the growing period during the summer, and they're in the velvet. They're very uh, susceptible to damage, and they take real good care of them. And these deer will actually mope around for a few days hmm. after these antlers are cut off. Oh, I didn't know that. So you're not only removing the uh, the dangerous part of them, but it sort of takes their spunk away. True. That Our, only lasts for a few days, however. Oh, and they get a little rambunctious oh, yeah. again. The the research that you've done up there on nutrition, you know, a lot of people, uh, they think that uh, we should just go on a big campaign to prevent starvation by maybe uh, getting a lot of helicopters and drop corn and hay from planes to the starving deer. What happens if, if you do that? Well, that's not the answer. If you take a uh, deer herd in a starved condition and then start giving him all the corn and hay that the, you can get to them, that isn't going to do them any good. They're not going to be able to digest this food, and they're going to end up dying as a result of this feeding mm. rather than starvation. But in southern Michigan, of course, they eat corn year-round. Right. Well, they're used to corn in this part of the uh, state, and, and they're, they have no problem. They start out eating corn in the fall and continue right on through the winter. Well, what is it that affects the antler growth of deer uh, nutritionally? I mean, I've, I've heard that nutrition and age and genetics all play in the antler development. But what is it that will grow big antlers for a buck? Uh, perhaps one of the best uh, foods that we found at this point is, uh, has been acorns. Years with good acorn crops, the following year you're going to have uh, antler development, uh, real good antler development on the bucks that following year. And of course this year the acorn crop has been down really right. bad. Yeah, we can probably look forward to, uh, to a smaller antler growth on the bucks next year. And how important are the acorns as deer food? Uh, is it, a, do they eat a lot on acorns? True, they, uh, years of good acorn crops, they're going to spend a lot of time in the acorns through the fall and even up until they can't uh, until they can't get at them in the winter. Boy, that's really something. Boy, the antlers on that buck, 
are terrific. Wouldn't it be nice to get a buck like that during deer season? Well, this buck came from the Porter Ranch. It was, how old was it? That buck there was approximately seven or eight years old, Fred. Do their antlers get smaller as they get older? Or they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. No, after they've gone beyond their prime, their peak years, probably in a pen situation, it would be six, seven, eight years, and they start to go downhill. Well, the research that you guys have done up there at the DNR at the Houghton Lake Research Station at the Porter Ranch is really it's surpassed what many other states have done. Uh, Michigan is known as a leader in that, and we should all be proud of the work that they're doing up there. John, congratulations. That was a Thank very you, interesting segment. Right now, we're going to talk about some basics. This is our back to basics section of Michigan Outdoors. Go to a little film to illustrate what you do in the woods, what you don't do in the woods when you get lost. Wilbur the Woodsman, not exactly the epitome of emergency preparedness, but what does he do when he gets lost? <laughs> he's always calling for help. Now he thinks he's pretty smart here, he's prepared, he took himself 20 cents along. That's in case he's out in the woods, he gets lost, he can make a call. Well, he was lucky, he found a tree phone. Well, he thinks he was lucky, I don't know about you, but I have never found a tree phone that worked. That's quite frustrating. But I don't want you to have those frustrations. One thing you can do is to carry along a day pack. A lot of people recommend it. Or survival kits. Put all sorts of things in the survival kits. Uh, extra clothes, ponchos, uh, a flashlight, you know, for the nighttime. But I want to spend a, just a couple minutes here showing you what you can do to avoid those problems too. One item that I would take above anything else is a compass. And you don't even have to have that compass in your day pack. It shouldn't be. It should be right where you can see it. Now, this is why I like a compass like this. It's a floating compass. You take it and pin it to your jacket, to the outside of your jacket. No matter how you pin it, you can always see the direction, north, south, east, or west. A lot of people say, oh, great, you know. Now I have a compass, but it doesn't tell me anything. I don't know how to use it. I'm going to have to find out. Well, I'm going to give you a simple explanation on how you use a compass. And believe me, it's very simple. Say you're, say you're up in this area, whether you're backpacking, camping, uh, fishing, hunting, you're right in your camp is right in the middle of this area, and you know this called this sand dunes off to the west. Okay, you have to have a map in your head that says there's sand dunes to the west. To the north of me, there's a lake. Back to the east, there's a river, and the camp is right by the river. Okay, so what you do when you leave camp and you start walking, you have to glance down and find out which direction you're going. I'm going west. You know that you're going to end up at the sand dunes, but you change course during the day and you head north. Well, you know that the lake is going to be up there. You keep that in mind. So when it comes time, your watch tells you it's time to go home. What do you do? Let's see. I'm north. The lake should be there. Without even seeing it, the sun doesn't have to be out. Say, I want to go east and run into that river. So you go back east. You walk back. And there it is. Finally, you hit the banks of the river, and you can work yourself back home. If you don't use a compass or don't trust your compass, you're going to walk in circles. I've done it myself a couple times, and it's frightening. It's downright scary, and it's nothing that you want to get involved in. The survival kits and the day packs with everything in it are great, but this little compass with a little bit of common sense and a map in your head can keep you out of trouble. And oh, time to get back to camp. Why? We have a great recipe waiting for us, stuffed venison bundles. Now for this prize winning recipe, you'll need a pound and a half or two pounds of venison steak. Round steak is good, cut in three by five inch thin pieces. A four ounce can of mushrooms, some butter or margarine, a medium sized onion, a couple beef bouillon cubes, some salt and some pepper, and a box of toothpicks. And to prepare these steaks, all we have to do is flatten them out with a meat pounder. This will do a couple things. I don't normally like to treat venison like this, treat any good meat like this, but boy, it's great in this recipe. It obviously makes the steaks a lot thinner, also makes them larger because they'll spread out, and those teeth on the pounder will break down the fibers in the meat and make it more tender if there was a problem in the first place. This is a good piece of round steak from a young buck, a yearling, and so that we won't have any trouble with that. But take those old bucks that are old enough to qualify for the...
Okay, stuffed venison bundles, a great one. You, sh you should try it. Now we're going to talk about a few other prize winners, our Master Anglers of the Week, and our weekly trophy report. This fish is a sauger, a cousin to the walleye. It's six pounds, three ounces. Tom Qua from Saginaw is only a half pound short of the state record. Took it in September in Torch Lake, Houghton County. Here's a cousin, not a cousin to the catfish, but it is a dogfish. It's also called a bowfin. 12 pounds, caught a couple weeks earlier, it would have temporarily been the state record. Mike LeClaire from Everett caught it from Lake Miramichi in Osceola County. Another close to state record fish is this 12 pound, two ounce white fish caught off Manistee in August on a flutter spoon. Glenn Carr from Adrian was the lucky master angler. Now actually, Glenn was really fishing for this fish right here, a lake trout. And this 20 pounder taken off Benzie County by Clarence Banky from Gladwin, also towards the end of August. Here is a nice coho. They don't often run this big, but Gene Palaluco from Pontiac took his 17 and a half pound prize on a J plug off Benzie County again, mid-September. But take a look at this. The Master Angler Trophy of the Week. We'll have to give it for length of nothing else to this Great Lakes muskie. Believe it or not, the fellow who caught it is 11-year-old Brian Regan of Marine City. His story goes that in August, he was fiddling around the St. Clair River, casting a bare hook, no bait at all, why bother when you can catch a 25-pound muskie 53 inches long? Congratulations, Brian. You're the Master Angler of the Week. Well, 11-year-old Brian Regan doesn't have that fish anymore, didn't get it mounted. They ate it already. But what a story, how he caught it on a bear hook. He's going to be on Michigan Outdoors in just a month or two to show us and explain how he did that. Great story. Right now, for you deer hunters, you have John McMurray on the phone, meteorologist, who's going to tell us about this weekend. John, a lot of hunters are wondering, the snow we have on the ground or the snow that might fall tonight in the Northland, is that going to be with us this weekend? I think most of it will melt. Uh, the, especially the air temperatures and ground temperatures for the past two weeks have been above normal. So an awful lot uh, of that snow, any snow, should pretty much come to a melting stage. Well, the winds we've had strong from the northwest blowing across the state, uh, are those winds going to be a problem this weekend, too? I think uh, it's still uh, rather gusty northwest winds on Saturday, uh, but the tendency will be for diminishing the wind speeds through the day Saturday and also for Sunday. Okay, so the winds will die down, which is good news, but the snow will melt, too. That's absolutely correct. Uh, that's not such good news, but the hunters now are looking forward to the following weekend. John, can you stick your neck out a little bit and uh, give us a forecast on tracking snow for Thanksgiving weekend? Uh, yeah, we may have some. I'd uh, really like to keep that forecast in my hip pocket for Thanksgiving because uh, very, very typically uh, at about that time of the year or the time of November, Mother Nature usually uh, wraps up a special gift package for us all on Thanksgiving Day, and sometimes we do get a pretty heavy snow across parts of the state. Well, thank you, John. Maybe that snow will help out. We'll look forward to your forecast next weekend on Thursday. Remember, next Thursday is going to be the next to the last show. Our big buck contest is coming up December 3rd. Make sure you get your entries in or send them to us here at Michigan Outdoors. We want to put you on television. See you next week. Rugged shore and woodlands of the north, its history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. And sometimes, when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can. Tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Satellite distribution of the preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Detroit chapter of Safari Club International.